Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest edition of the Manchester is Red podcast from the Manchester Evening News. We are counting down to Derby Day today. Uh, recording this late on Friday afternoon after Eric Ten Hag's press set. Derby at 12.30 on Saturday. Uh, huge, huge game for United. Real test of how much progress they've they've made recently. Uh, I'm Tyrone Marshall, hosting today. I'm joined by Samuel Lockhurst, who was with Ten Hag earlier. Afternoon, Samuel. Good afternoon, Ty. Always good to be uh, the, the the striking duo that that we are. It's, it's very rare <laughs> these days, but here we are, yeah. late on a Friday. Indeed, the Cole and York of the uh, the MEN duo. Although those two didn't like each other particularly, did they? So maybe that wasn't uh, maybe that wasn't the best example. Um, oh no, that was that was yeah, Colin, so, Sher- Colin Sheringham. Oh, it was Colin, Colin Sheringham, Sheringham, wasn't it? Like Colin Sheringham. Yes. yes, we're in the clear with Colin York, aren't we? Um, yeah, I yeah. Think so looking ahead to Derby, then we'll we'll start with a bit of a bit of transfer business, I guess. Um, Foot Vegorst has, has dominated the agenda this week. A move to United is close now, according to uh, Eric Ten Hag. What what did Ten Hag have to say um, earlier today about uh, about his his countrymen? He, he said they were they were close, as as you said there. Uh, the fact that he's actually speaking about their course indicates that it's it's imminent, and one of the reasons why we had to leave Carrington um, earlier than no- normal was because somebody was going to have a picture in that press room, and no, no prizes for guessing who, who that will be. That exactly that that room is is where the the pictures get taken of, of signings as well before anyone suggests that oh it's 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 always done off site or some nonsense or other. Uh, uh, it, so, as I said, I think it's just a, a matter of when we get a message confirming that that deal is done. And, and in fairness to United, it's been it's been dealt with quite swiftly. And the the, the interest emerged last Saturday. We're speaking just gone four pm on the Friday. He's I think the way it's going, he, we'd expect an announcement from the club uh, this evening. Not not exactly the most sociable hours to announce a transfer uh, when it's Friday night and people want to wind down a little bit. But uh, that that would be a, a pretty prompt signing, all things considered. And of course, the complexities of um, of dealing of trying to get a player in on loan who's already on loan elsewhere, as you've obviously you've covered very comprehensively this week, Ty. Yeah, uh, I mean, United have made a habit of announcing signings on the pitch recently with uh, for Ran and Casemiro. I, I'm not sure announcing Veghorst on the pitch before City fits quite the same bill, but uh, but you never know. They've obviously missed the deadline, the midday deadline today to to get him in, and we, we've had plenty of Veghorst stuff today uh, on the site this week. Obviously, like we said, a, a real sort of complex deal to do and a, a difficult deal to do with with him being at Besiktas and no recall option. It, it, I guess it's difficult to know what, what to make of, of this signing. United needed a striker. This is clearly the cut price option. Ten Hag knows what he's getting with, with another Dutch striker. His record everywhere is okay, apart from his time in the Premier League. Um, but what, I mean, what, what, what are your what are your initial reactions and, and what are your thoughts now? I guess on on this deal because it, it's gone down pretty well, you would say, with the fan base, despite the fact that he's an, an unglamorous name, really. Which is a reflection of United's form and the the goodwill that that Ten Hag has banked. They're making this signing from a position of strength. That there are parallels between uh, Veghorst and Marco Arnautovic in terms of playing style and uh, holding the ball up. In terms of his skill set, what United have said about Veghorst reminds me of what they said about Marco Arnautovic before they withdrew from that deal. But of course, the time of the Arnautovic one was was awful. It was the first weekend of the season. They hadn't signed uh, an attacker all summer. They hadn't signed a midfielder all summer. And here they were trying to cut corners by going for someone who played, who was playing for Bologna, still plays for Bologna. Uh, but he'd he'd obviously gone off to the Chinese Super League. That was where when he left West Ham. Must have been nearly nearly four years ago now. So that's that's how perceptions change. If if you're in a position to um, if you're in a position of strength or relative strength, which United are in at the moment, the perception of the supporters is going to be more favourable. Um, I don't think my, my my opinion of it has, has changed too much. It's not like it's. I mean, when I first heard about United going for Ericsson, I wasn't too certain about that. I thought it was convenient. He's a freebie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But watching him up close, uh, you you appreciate what a brilliant player he is, and he's been a brilliant signing for United so far. With Veghorst, they needed a body in this month. I think we all knew that they weren't going to spend uh, a significant amount of money because of the investment in the summer. They were clearly going to be linked with a lot of forwards who were, were attainable this month, uh, be it on a permanent basis or a loan basis. I think Liverpool did everyone a favour getting Gakpo in as, as 
quickly as they did because that that killed that stone dead. Uh, that that notion that United would go for him, Gakpo was not what United needed. There was a, he's far more needed by Liverpool than he's United, as as we've discussed chapter and verse. He's he's a left winger. I don't think Jao Felix was what United need. He's he's clearly a better footballer than Veghorst. He's a sexier name for supporters, but he's not he's not a number nine. Uh, he's he's more of a technician and. I remember being told once that uh, George Mendes was complaining a few months into Felix's time at Lesco that he, he was complaining about him playing on the right wing. So, OK, you're not going to play him on the right wing. You're certainly not going to play him on the left wing because the amount of players United have there. Fernandes is the number 10. Uh, could you make a number nine out of him in a short period of time? It, there, there were quite a lot of cons with that. And of course, the other con was the uh, £9 million loan fee. It's not a surprise whatsoever that Chelsea are the team, are the suckers, if you like, who who have gone for him. Um, they're in absolute disarray. It's it's really amateur hour there. And it has been ever since Todd Burley uh, completed his takeover of the club, the way he's operated. Uh, if you're a Chelsea fan, you'd have no faith in him whatsoever. It is very reminiscent of the way Ed Woodward operated in uh, certainly his first couple of years as executive vice chairman of United. But I actually think Chelsea, the way they're going about it, is a hell of a lot worse. And they're making a very good coach who had a terrific reputation before he went there uh, look very bad now, even though he might, he's obviously complicit in in the struggles they've they've encountered of late so it it was always going to be you know, someone of you know relative not, not not great repute someone who's going to be relatively frugal and all things considered it it, it does represent some progress on Odi Nagalo which isn't saying a great deal i i think Vague Horse would have to do a a pretty substantial amount to actually be deemed a success uh, at United. But a success might just be, even if he doesn't score a goal, but if he's allowing Marshall to um, start in the games that matter most and that Marshall goes from strength to strength and his form improves and he get, he gets the benefit of certain rests here and there, then and, and United finish in the top four and they win a trophy, then that, that probably counts or constitutes a success of some sort. But it it does feel a little bit strange because he's being brought in and you feel that he's not necessarily being brought in to to score goals, even though he's a striker. He is there as a support act. He's not necessarily someone that Ten Hag is going to be turning to on the bench when United are in need of a goal. You'd be more inclined to go to Garnacho, of course. You'd probably be more inclined to go to Facundo Palestri or um, Fred is is a player who has ability to uh, un- unlock defences uh, the way he can play um, passes and he's had good impacts off the bench of late as well. So it'll be interesting to see how he's used because it's th- this is just a stopgap and of course come the summer um, the, the striker that comes in and United are going to need a striker to come in the likelihood is that they will be coming in to, to replace Marshall. It, it seems unforeseeable that given how significantly United need to invest in a long-term striker, that that striker won't be going straight into the team. And if he's going into the team, he's taking Marshall's place. And from one player who won't play in the derby to some others who, who may not, uh, Donny van der Beek wouldn't have played had he been fit, but uh, he is not. He's out for the rest of the season. Unfortunately, he uh, he literally can't catch a break. Really, at um, at United, finally given his chance by Ten Hag in the Premier League ten days ago now, and, and has picked up that knee injury um, through no real fault of his own. Just a a tackle really, and his knee getting caught and, and out for the rest of the season. Uh, and another major setback for him, really. Um, Diogo Dallo, we know he's also out as well. That is is not the disaster it probably was a month ago. Aaron Wambasaka, as as I think we all agree, has done pretty well recently as his as his standing and has looked a, a much more competent right back. And and then we've got Marshall, who, who I think Tenag said is is kind of touch and go and and a late fitness test. And I guess he's the, the rest of the team. I think picks itself really with with Dallo being out. I guess the only issue there is is what Ten Hag does in the attack and is Martial fit enough to start? Can he get through? 55, 60 minutes and, and get Rashford on the left in, in what has generally been his best position. That that Looking at it, that's the only question mark you'd have over uh, over the team for the derby, isn't it? Well, it's. I mean, they are in danger of handing City the initiative there tactically because if, even if Marshall does start now, it's 
I mean, it's as certain as night is and day is that he's going to come off and they're going to have to make an alteration there. And after, given the way Alanga played in the week, I think it's safe to say that he wouldn't be the player coming on to replace Marshall. So United are going to have to make a tweak there of some sort, whether it's, I mean, you, the, the one you instantly think of is Rashford. You have to move Rashford up front. So it feels inevitable that at some point tomorrow, Rashford is going to have to occupy that number nine role. And maybe Garnacho is the one who comes on, if it is indeed that case, or, or Garnacho starts and Rashford is, is the one up front if, if Marshall's not able to make it. But this is the this is the invidious position United are in, because even if their course was available and he'd, you know, he'd they'd got him in um, before the deadline, I don't think anybody would be saying, OK, we'll throw him straight into the team. And I don't think they would have done that. But even if he had a week's worth of training under his belt and he was eligible for the game, I still don't think people would be saying, put him in the team. I think the the general consensus would be start Garnacho, play Rashford up front, even though Rashford, as we all know, is, is very best from the left. But he's, he's clearly going to have to fill in. And he did fill in earlier in the season. Uh, when when Marshall was picking up injuries left, right, and centre, but Marshall's durability is, is a major, major problem. It, it it feels it doesn't feel that far removed from the Sancho situation, and you know, there there are aspects of the Sancho situation that are unclear for obvious reasons, and you know there's, there's no point really speculating on them. But with Marshall, it does just seem purely physical, and. Given that he's been fit since uh, early November, well, up, up until this week anyway, so that's that's two months. It's it's strange that United are still encountering issues with um, with his physicality and with his with his brittleness because this is a fourth injury now this season. He's missed he's missed thirteen weeks of the season through three separate injuries, and you can't you can't carry that risk. And uh, United have have to obviously carry that risk for for at least another another four four months four and a half months if if they're in the thick of it and contending for for trophies towards the end of the season but it's really not ideal being in that situation and that's that's why again i i can't see what what, however positive people are about marshall and he's had an okay season from the opportunities he's had but he's not going to be the main number nine next season. He can't be. If he's as brittle as he is at the moment, you can't expect him to be, you know, cussing it for another another full season. And as we've said, he's, he's seven, and, seven and a half years into his United career now and he's only broken the 20-goal barrier once. And it's it's unfortunate for him that he's got these issues because it is holding him back. And when you watch him, you do... You get the sense he's playing within himself... Uh, within himself, sorry. And... I mean, you know, people can joke, well, he always looks that way. You know, his, his body language never changes. You can't tell whether he's injured sometimes. And there is some truth to that as well. But you know, as I said, I, th- I think where Guardiola will know already, well, if if, Guard, if, if Marshall's not starting, they're probably going to have to play their, their best player on form out of position. If he is starting, he's coming off on the hour mark. I can have a plan in place to counter that if it is Garnacho coming on I mean I think Guardiola is probably thinking he might be one or two steps ahead here tactically even though City have had their own issues in recent weeks and the, the mood in the United camp going into this game is is pretty bullish and rightly so given their form and, and give us an insight into what Eric was like in the rest of the um, the presser really we, we've talked there about the, the main news lines I would say from, from the open section I guess beyond that it was very low on, on, on news lines, but there was a lot of stuff about City and, and facing City and, and that kind of thing. Like you, you mentioned there, United are on a fantastic run. I think it's eight wins in a row now in, in all competitions. They they really are flying at the moment. And the, the mood, like you say, is, is bullish. It feels like a real confidence that they can get a result tomorrow. What sort of vibe did, did Tenag give off in, in his press conference? It wasn't the juiciest of pre-derby press conferences. You, uh, from from experience, we've we've got better stuff from from Solskjaer going into a derby, which you you might not expect. But I think Solskjaer had that attachment to to the to the fixture from from when he played in. Um, I mean, he played in the last Main Road derby and he scored in it. It was a pretty cool in day for United. So I think those he, he liked to play on the whole, uh, you know, play the history card as well. So it, it suited him. Whereas with Ten Hag, the, the the press conference was pretty dry today, and they've they've not been dry very often at all recently. I mean, I was getting 
was getting frustrated that nobody was asking about team news. And then in, in the open bit, this is so this is a section where us, um, the, the, the print guys, us who are there in for, for, for the newspapers and, and some of the websites, we have our separate embargoed section. So we don't ask questions in this opening section, but they took an eternity to get around to team news. And then they didn't ask about Van der Beek. I did ask about Van der Beek and Ten Hag and Venus out for the season, but we knew that wasn't going to hold. And then you've got bloody aggregator account somehow, uh, you know, g- getting the information. God knows how uh, it's, you know, but, but anyway, you can't do anything about it. And so there were a lot of questions on City, as you would expect, but it was nothing, as I said, it was nothing juicy. It was nothing that really pricked up ears. Um, I think Ten Hag is is quite quite a smart cookie in that he doesn't want to say anything that could um, c- could be spun or depicted as him being in a, being in an antagonistic um, mood and, and trying to rile City or put them under pressure. I don't think he's ever going to play that game. Uh, there was a question he was asked in, about in the embargoed section, which practically confirmed that as well. So he was never going to stir the pot there. Whereas Solskjaer, I remember him saying um, when he was a player, it, you know, the derby, I think he, he's, he's quote something like, oh, when I was a player, we hardly ever played City. And that was true because in his first first uh, six years as a player at United, in fact, uh, sorry, five, four or five years, I think it was, uh, yeah, it, four, first four and a half years, if you like, um, City were in Division One or Division Two. They, they weren't even in the Premier League. So Solskjaer had to wait a good while to actually play in a Manchester derby and he could draw on that but Ten Hag has no interest in that whatsoever and where there's clearly you know, very good very mutual respect between him and Guardiola Guardiola said last season he suggested that Ten Hag could be his replacement at City I think he said earlier this season that United are coming back um, you know, so two big compliments that reflect uh, very favourably on, on Ten Hag and, and would indicate that, that Guardiola is actually taking United seriously whereas when, when Solskjaer was in charge he, he didn't really have that problem at all. The one thing you could say about United's recent form and, and that eight game winning run is, is that it's been against a relatively mediocre opposition I guess you could say you've got to go and beat them and United have made short work of them but they've not faced a test like this in that run they have got a good record generally against fellow big six teams this year with the obvious exception of the uh, the reverse fixture at the Etihad when when 6-3 even flattered them 6-1 down with a few minutes to go I mean this feels like a, a, a real it, it's an easy cliche in a way but it's a real test of their progress since then I think isn't it they're, I think they've had 18 games since then won 15 drawn two lost one they feel yeah. and look like a completely different team in, in just over three months and there's been a few changes since then the most obvious for me is Casemiro, who hadn't started a Premier League game since then and has played all but four minutes um, since since the Etihad game in, in midfield in the Premier League for United, or in the Premier League for United, did play centre after me. Um, but he he has been a transformative figure. Um, and it feels like this is a game that United go into where they can really show just how much progress there has been in three and a half months. Well, he was asked about Casemiro in the open section today. And I, I kind of like, knew in my head that he's going to say cement between the stones here and of course he did say cement between the stones which is this this phrase that he's used to describe Casemiro what feels like every time that he's asked about him it's it's happening on a it must be a monthly basis now and I think for those of us who are at every press conference and have to absorb as much as many ten hard quotes as possible we're all you know we're all au fait with with, with these quotes and we know what he's going to say if someone who isn't isn't a regular at Carrington comes up with it, and it was perfectly, you know, good, good reasonable question on Casemiro because, as you said, he has been uh, tra- transformative since he came in. I remember thinking during the six three and, and before it, in fact, that Casemiro having not been in, integrated into the team yet, I, I just sensed that that was going to be a problem that day, and it was because they didn't have a defensive midfielder, certainly an out and out defensive midfielder. And there are clear limitations with the way Scott McTominay plays. Um, that's that's just what you get. He's he's a good professional. He he, he is an asset in certain occasions. He's uh, been an asset in certain moments, and he's he's had a good career at United. He's overachieved at United to pretty much still be there and to have played as often as he as, as many times as he has done. But he should not be a, a starting uh, midfielder at United and. 
I think in retrospect, you know, Ten Hag might look at that and think, why didn't I get Casemiro back into the team quicker? And there was there was mitigation with that because they had two matches postponed due to the Queen's death. So they had this very strange period of going about three or four weeks and they only had one game during that uh, that time, which was the, uh, what was it? It was FC Sheriff, wasn't it? Away. How could you forget, unfortunately for you? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I suppose the only thing that took it on with what he said about Casemiro today was that he, about his passing, how he accelerates the play, which is, is mm. true. I mean, what everyone watching him this season, they've, it seems like everyone says what a brilliant passer he is. And I mean, at Real Madrid, he was surrounded by two of the great pass, pass masters of the last 20, 30 years. But watching him, it, it's he's probably on a par with Cruz and Modric. He just didn't need to, to showcase it very often because they, they did all that work um, for, for the Madrid midfield. And I mean, Madrid did it. Even the great Real Madrid did extremely well to keep those three together for what eight years and there's there's a reason why they won what four or five champions leagues during that time yeah i mean rashford stole the headlines as the super sub on tuesday really but some of casemiro's passing after he came on I and mean, you could hear gasps at old trafford with some of the switches yeah. of play and his ability just to, to to pick those forward passes in space and you don't always get it from a holding midfielder often it's just keep it give it give it short to cruise and moderates like he used to but he's really shown that Passing ability at United is is unparalleled. Really, it's been a, a major trait of his. Um, we, we talked about United's form there. I, I guess you know there's two teams to make a derby, and you look at City and assess City's form, and it's it's a lot it's a lot trickier, isn't it? Um, I've done a few of their games recently, and at Leeds they played very well and and kind of rocked it, rocked a bit in the last fifteen minutes. You wouldn't say hanging on for three one at the end, but they could have easily conceded another in that game while also having more than enough chances to get more of their own. The, the Liverpool-Carabao Cup game, they won 3-2 and could have won it 5 or 6-2, really. But beyond that, there's been some some iffy performances. I mean, Brentford before the World Cup, they were they were second best there. Everton at home recently, they were they were pretty poor and Everton lost 4-0 at home to Brighton a few days later. And then that Carabao Cup performance on Wednesday, which, which is great news for United in terms of opening up a, a, a route to a trophy. An absolutely bizarre City performance to watch, really. And, and Guardiola made a, a few changes at half time and some early in the second half, and it didn't really have any discernible difference. And they've just they've had games where they just look really, really flat at the moment. And we it feels like we kind of know what to expect from United tomorrow. We know what team they're going to pick, how they're going to play. We know they're going to be a lot better than they were in the six three game with City. It's it's not quite so clear, and they've. They've got this number nine that we all said they needed. He's he's unbelievable. His goal scoring record's incredible, but it feels like they're they're a worse team for it at the moment. And I think there's there's a feeling maybe that as, as well as United are playing, it, it, it City are a little bit vulnerable as well tomorrow, perhaps. It, it's strange because you, you half wonder if it's just all manifesting itself and that come Derby Day it'll be a, a masterclass from from Guardiola and City. And if if City play well, they they will probably win. Uh, and and of course, in the last two weeks, they have had these these wobbles. If you like, I mean, th- th- they shouldn't be getting held one one at home by Everton, but they did. They couldn't break them down. No attempts on target in the week against Southampton. I thought when Alvarez had that chance early in the second half, even though he missed it, I just thought, well, that's going to set the tone for uh, a second half onslaught, and they're going to be peppering Gavin Bazunu's goal, and they'll end up going through to the semi finals. But it, it didn't happen, uh, remarkably. And of course, Guardiola has made this, you know, this was, I mean, this was his doing. He he said about the body language of certain players. And I think it's everyone's safe in naming those players because the amount of times Carl Walker, for example, has been subbed off recently. I think he was subbed off at half time against Chelsea. He was subbed off at half time again in the week at Southampton. So he's he's not in favour at the moment. Uh, the, the comments about Calvin Phillips' weight were bizarre, really. Uh, they, they clearly didn't have the des- the effect, or sorry, the desired effect when Guardiola said them, and then he tried to downplay them, saying, "Oh, he's he's got a sexy body, so so sexy." And you you know what Guardiola is doing? He's trying to make light of it, but the damage has been done. And after the game in midweek, I think Sky did a, a standalone segment on on Phillips's performance and how bad he was because it was his first start for City. So that transfer has actually been a, a, a 
bit of a disaster so far for them. I mean, we've seen it before with City players. The first year is one of integration. They don't do a great deal in it. And then the second season, they play like a house on fire. I think Bernardo Silva is probably the best example of that. And there have been other examples. Uh, Mares brings to mind. Maybe Grealish this season will will end it and look back and say he had a, a brilliant season. But the, the jury is still a bit out there. So, you know, but the but the thing is, you you take all that into context, and from United's perspective, you you extract hope from that. But then you look at the options City can play in their front six. And I, when I saw their team against Chelsea, I just thought, well, they should be they should be taking Chelsea to the cleaners. I mean, it is an absolutely awesome uh, collection of footballers that they can play in those three midfield positions and the three three attacking positions and okay with with Cancelo he's not been in particularly good form at all this season but he is he is unique in that he's not so much a fallback as a as a playmaker so they've got so many strings to their bow uh they've they've got a good record in derbies I think since since the the Rooney uh overhead kick goal in in February 2011 United have only won three derbies at Old Trafford, uh, which is pretty remarkable given that encompasses nearly 12 years of of, of home derbies for them. And they've got as, as poor a record as that. And you know, City have got experience of, of, of doing it in, in different ways. They've, they've won it in, in quite dogged ways, as, as they did against Mourinho's United, a couple of 2-1 wins. They, they thumped Solskjaer's United, of course. Last season, the, the 2-0 scoreline uh, was, was an absolute travesty. Uh, and obviously, Guardiola was asked afterwards if he was disappointed to have only won 2-0. He was like, no, no, it's OK. It's OK. Almost as if, you know, I, I'm Ole in here. Please, please keep him. <laughs> and it, it really it really should have been 5-0 minimum. There was the great stat that day that United had was it United had more attempts on target at their own goal than they did at City's goal because Bailly scored an own goal. Lindelof Lindelof had a um, clearance that De Gea had to um, palm away as well, and it was just a Ronaldo shot that United had that tested Edison up the other end. So it was even though the, the score line looked borderline respectable, uh, it was a galling day, and we were in that strange period that. It, the, the, it depended on the result whether United would sack Ole Gunnar Solskjaer the next day and they clearly looked at him and thought 2-0 away 2-0 at home losing to City it's not that bad we'll, we'll let, give him another two weeks and then of course two weeks later they get turned over 4-1 at, at Watford and, and that was the final straw That's the look ahead to, to City done. We'll, we'll have a brief recap, I guess, of the, the Charlton game. It, it feels a while ago now. Um, but a another pretty routine win, really. More rotation than we expected from Ten Hag. No no one really putting their hands up to, to force their way into that team. And, and like we said, he had to go to the bench, really, with Casemiro and, and Rashford. But it was a, a professional job, I guess, for United. A job well done and continued Rashford's in, incredible form, really. I think that's six six games in a row he scored in now, seven goals in that period. He he looks as confident as he's probably ever looked, doesn't he? Which is a remarkable transformation from the back end of last season. Oh, it is. This time last season, he had three goals for United. And of course, he got a couple towards the end of January at Brentford and the, the vital winner against West Ham. And you wondered whether that would be a season-defining moment for him. It wasn't. It just got worse for him, unfortunately. But every time he's in a position to score now, he looks like he's going to score. And we've very rarely said that. Even a few years ago when he was in terrific form and that season he ended up with, with 22 goals. And unfortunately for him, his, his season was was disrupted by that back injury. So he was out for... I mean, the pandemic helped in terms of wiping fixtures off the um, schedule in, in April and, and May and most of March. But I think he was out injured for essentially three or four months and he, and he still missed quite quite a few games. But I think what's interesting is that when you look at, because he's got this record now of scoring in eight successive home games and the last home game he didn't score in was against Tottenham, which was a performance from him that was, I'd say, would have been complete if he'd scored. He was he played up front, and as as we've discussed many times, nobody really sees that as his best position. But he was the modern number nine that night, apart from his finishing. And I think he had a, he had 
two, at least two really, really great chances that he shouldn't have given Lloris a prayer with. But Lloris, I think Lloris saved both of them. The second, the one the second half was more impressive. I think that was that was slightly more memorable. But it was almost as if, rather than you know feeling a bit uh, downtrodden by not getting a goal in that game, he's he's responded to it and we saw him respond to being disciplined at Wolves and this is another form of a response in that the next home game I believe or certainly the next league, home game in the league it's West Ham and he scores that bullet header from Ericsson's cross which again is a goal when we when we saw it at the time you're, you're jolted by it one by the brilliance and two by the the identity of the goal scorer because he hasn't scored and doesn't score many headers and so he's I think he's bringing more variation to his game. We, we spoke about his assists against Everton in the Cup. Both of them were left-footed. Um, Charlton in midweek, OK, you, you know, the fact that you're scoring against them, it's not necessarily impressive. But the way he took those goals, and the first goal, I think, is, is pretty underrated the way he takes it because it, it almost looks like it's getting away from him, but he just does that little dink into the corner. And there's no way he would have been finishing like that. Uh, this time last year or even necessarily at the start of the season he had that brilliant chance against Brighton which I think if he put it in it, the goal would have stood because although the flag was raised it did look like Ronaldo was was on when he received the ball so it it has been a, a hell of a turnaround from him and also as far as his league goals are concerned because I think in, t- in the Premier League he's probably scored about six or seven in the league which is modest when you consider he scored 15 overall but I think all of those goals have earned United points. Uh, winner against Liverpool, uh, winning goal against Arsenal, winning goal against West Ham. He scored the first against Forest. That's technically a winner. Winner against Wolves as well. So that's that's 15 points, effectively, um, minimum. And I'm probably missing out maybe one or two others. So, yeah, that that's a... That's a better way of measuring his goals. You can have a forward who scores loads of goals, but I mean, Lukaku was the master of this. If you're three and up in a game, the chances are he's going to um, get the fourth one, and it, it might be a tap in. So uh, it's it's a it's a better way of measuring Rashford's impact, and his his impact has been tremendous uh, for, for most of the season. I thought he was having a pretty decent season up until the World Cup. Since and at the World Cup to now, he's. If, if he maintains this, he, it's a matter of time until he's regarded as a truly world-class player. Yeah. Right, I think that, uh, that covers pretty much everything. United have drawn Nottingham Forest in the semi-finals of the Carabao Cup, as you've probably seen now. A real opportunity for them to uh, to finally get their hands on, on some silverware after six years. But it's uh, it's the focus on the Premier League and the derby tomorrow. The MEN is obviously the only place you need to look on Saturday for all your derby action and reaction. Um, you can also get this podcast on our YouTube channel now if you want to watch me and Samuel. And frankly, why wouldn't you? What else are you going to watch on a Friday night? If you search for Manchester United MEN on YouTube, you can uh, find the channel and subscribe to it. There's Clips from Eric Ten Hag's press conference there, and there's a video also of uh, myself dissecting the Voot Veghorst transfer, why United want him, what they've paid for him, what he can do, just about everything you'd, you'd want to know on uh, on Voot Veghorst is in that video. So uh, subscribe to the channel and give it a watch. We'll be back with another podcast on Monday with all the fallout from Derby Day, whatever may happen sure to be a a fascinating game and an unpredictable game and the MEN is the place to be to get all of that action but that's all for now we'll speak to you on Monday